This is the final sermon uh, or talk in our series, Reason for God. We are looking at a number of common objections uh, to the Christian faith. And uh, today we're looking uh, at the Bible. And we're trying to uh, have a conversation, really, rather than you sitting there listening to me, uh, 10 feet above contradiction. Uh, we're actually trying to engage in dialogue. And the way we're doing that is after the talk, there'll be a panel four people, and uh, they will take your questions. But we're not taking questions from the floor, because that's quite a challenging way of doing it. We're asking you instead to text in. There should be a number on the screen at some point during the talk behind me. And uh, so if you've got your phones and a question comes to your mind, text it in, and the guys at the back will then type it up on the screen, and uh, we'll be able to answer it, or try to, uh, later on. If you are... Uh, uh, you have a Twitter feed and you'd like to tweet, uh, then please feel free to do that as well. Uh, just hashtag reason for God. If you have no idea what that means, don't worry. <laughs> Today we are asking the question, what about the Bible? Uh, surely we can't take the Bible literally. And it's an objection centered around its historical unreliability and the sense that somehow it's a text that's so old it's culturally primitive. And so, you, you know, you will hear those around you saying, you just can't take the Bible literally. And what they mean is, you can't insist that everyone believes everything that's in it. And that's because they would argue, some things are wrong, factually. They are historically inaccurate. And others would say, well, actually, some things, they're bad. They're culturally primitive. And the objection goes, that means that the Bible cannot be trustworthy, neither can it be authoritative. So how might we respond to that? And I'm just going to, going to suggest three ways this morning. Uh, you can trust the Bible historically, you can trust the Bible culturally, and you must trust the Bible personally. I'm not sure, I'm, I can hear a little rattle on my headphones. Is it me? There we go. Hopefully that might change, but we'll see. Hang on. Let me tighten this up. Is that better? Let's, let's see how we go. If I need to change mic, I'll change the mic. Um, let's start with you can, take, you can trust the Bible historically. There's a modern claim, isn't there, that the documents of the New Testament were concocted by the political winners, those who uh, developed a particular theology in the early church movement. Uh, and the argument goes that the New Testament documents, they were written much later uh, by the leaders of the new church that were consolidating their power and trying to bolster this new movement called Christianity. And what they did to do that, they suppressed earlier evidence, and so really, 2,000 years later, we have no idea who the original Jesus really was. That's the objection. How might we respond? Well, I think there are three responses. And the first is this. The New Testament really was written too early to be legend. We're in Luke's Gospel, which is one of the four biographies of Jesus. If you just flick over to the beginning of the Gospel, chapter 1, which you can find on page seven, uh, 969, sorry, 968. We're going to look at the first few verses. Luke, chapter 1. Luke describes for us his, his methodology. How has he gone about writing this text? And this is what he says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from whom the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. Luke here is talking about a careful investigation that he undertook. He interviewed eyewitnesses. And he's only now writing 30 or 40 years later, and many of them are still alive. Remarkably, you can see a great example of that in uh, Mark's gospel, just a few pages before chapter 1. Uh, in Mark 15, verse 21, which is page 966. There's a fascinating verse there. 
Fascinating detail. Jesus is um, going to uh, Golgotha, where he's going to be crucified. He's being led there by the Romans, and they grab a man to ask him to, or to force him to carry the cross beam. And this is what Mark records in his biography of Jesus. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. It's a fascinating verse, that, isn't it? They identify this man, Simon, from Cyrene. But then Mark adds a second detail, that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, why did he do that? I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Richard Borkham, a New Testament scholar in Cambridge, written a book uh, called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, which was a bit of a bombshell in New, in New Testament studies a few years ago. He said there's only one plausible reason why Mark would identify Alexander and Rufus. And that's because his readers knew them. They were like, oh yes, Alexander, my mate, I know him. Or my grandma knows Rufus. There was a familiarity there. These were eyewitnesses, and they were still alive. And Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 15, he says that the risen Jesus uh, met 500 disciples all at the same time. And then he says, and many of them are still alive. So if you want to go and talk to them about it, please do. An extraordinary claim to make in a public letter if it's not true. Interestingly, in another of Paul's letters, in uh, the, uh, the letter to the Philippian church, again, written only about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Paul quotes an early Christian hymn that was already in use th- across the churches. And it describes Jesus as being in the form of God. It says at this early date, Jesus is divine. And really, if we're honest, it makes a mockery of Dan Brown's claims in his novel, The Da Vinci Code. So the New Testament documents, they're just too early to be make-believe. Second thing to say is that their content is too counterproductive to be legend. If there are, as the modern claim goes, simply about consolidating the power of the early leaders, they do a terrible job. So Jesus is in the garden uh, the day before his crucifixion, and he's pleading with God to get him out of it. On the cross, he uh, cries out in dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the moment of triumph, at his resurrection, surely the cornerstone of the Christian faith, the Bible talks about Women as the first witnesses to the resurrection. What a crazy thing to do in the first century where the judgment of women was just always doubted. They were not good witnesses, so why use them if it's all about consolidating power? And then wonder if you read Mark's gospel, it's, it's quite funny really, but the, the poor apostles, they are just portrayed as idiots and fools. Now why would you do that if they were trying to consolidate their positions in the new movement? The only plausible reason is that they are memories of what actually happened. Third thing to say is it's too detailed in form to be legend. Many of us enjoy um, a, a historical, realistic novel, don't we? But you may not know that those are, uh, they haven't existed for very long. The first modern novel was written in the 18th century. In the first century, fiction looked like Beowulf or Homer. They were epics and myths and sagas. And none of them ever began. I myself have carefully investigated these things. It was C.S. Lewis, who was himself a renowned literary critic and classical scholar, who said, I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends and myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know none of them are like this. Of this gospel text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, or else some unknown ancient writer without predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic realistic narrative. That's not likely, is it? So I think you can trust the Bible historically. It was written too early, it's too counterproductive, too detailed. 
Second point, you can trust the Bible culturally. And I think in the last 20 years, this has become uh, more of a problem for us as a society, for us as a culture in the UK. A few years ago, there was an exhibition called Made in Our Image in uh, Glasgow's Gallery of Modern Art. And uh, there was an exhibit which was the Bible open, and people were asked to come and write themselves into the text. So they would come and, and, and scribble on the text itself and deface the Bible. And some of them wrote terrible things about a text they had found had been terrible to them. That exhibition was a, a saying effectively, the Bible is offensive, come and get your own back on it. So I want to suggest three ways this morning that we can handle that offense, because in our culture we will find texts that are offensive, that bring about that reaction quite quickly. But how can we continue exploring the possibility that the Bible might be the word of God whilst handling that sense of offense? three things. The first is to consider the possibility that the Bible doesn't teach you what you immediately think it teaches you. So if you think about these uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, they were upset. They were upset because they thought the Bible taught them something that actually it didn't. They thought it taught that the Messiah would militarily conquer the Romans, throw them out of Israel, and liberate the nation but they had misunderstood what the Bible said. So if something offends you that you've written, what I want to suggest to you is is be patient. Investigate the context. So let me give you an example. On first reading of Genesis, the view of women in that book is terrible. You have great heroes of faith like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and yet there is an assumption of polygamy. So they buy and sell multiple wives all the time. Uh, There is the assumption of primogeniture. So the first and eldest son will inherit everything. And then, of course, you just have that that sense that the, the whole world is naturally patriarchal. And you're, we, I'm offended by that, and I hope you are too. But if you look a little bit closer, you begin to see something different. You see that uh, as the stories unfold, polygamy wreaks havoc in every generation. It's a bad thing that the writer is critiquing. Extraordinarily, God always chooses the second son and subverts primogeniture. And so what you see is Genesis actually consistently subverts the cultural norms of the ancient Near East. So what I want to suggest is that you wrestle with the text. You don't reject the text. Rick, is it worth me swapping microphones? How's that? There we go. Right, let's keep going. Um, So that's the first thing. The second thing is to consider the possibility that you're misunderstanding what the Bible is saying because of your own cultural assumptions. So the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they misunderstood what the Bible was actually saying because of their Jewish cultural assumptions. Look at verse 20 and 21 of chapter 24. They were only looking to the redemption of Israel. They hadn't even thought about the redemption of the world, but that's actually what the Bible is all about. A good example of that today might be something like slavery. A common cultural objection to the Bible is surely it condones slavery. Paul, after all, says, slaves obey your masters. I rest my case, a skeptic would say. Enough said. But again, if you dig a little bit deeper, you realize that first century slavery is very different from uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century slavery that we're more familiar with. First century slavery was indentured service. You could earn money. You could buy yourself out of slavery. Uh, It was quite, they they often did respected jobs. 17th, 18th, 19th century slavery was uh, race-based slavery that was uh, funded through kidnap. And so you see two different reactions to Christians in the first century. They begin to subvert that indentured service. So if you read Paul's letter to Philemon, He doesn't command, but he 
subtly suggests. Whereas in the 18th century and the 19th century, Christians confront slavery because it's something completely different that they must oppose with everything they have. And it's hard for us in the 21st century to look back beyond that expression of slavery to the first century. We have cultural assumptions that are difficult to get beyond. So consider the possibility that when you're offended by Scripture, you're actually reading the text through your own cultural assumptions. And thirdly, consider the possibility that you may be offended because you uncritically assume that your culture is superior to others. It's a trap that we all fall into, isn't it, if we're honest with ourselves? You know, for us in the UK, in the West, there will be plenty of Scripture that we'll find offensive. But we've got to remember that the Scripture that we find offensive may not be offensive in another culture. So, for example, sex, uh, the Bible's teaching on sex. In the individualistic West, it's offensive. We find it repressive. In the Middle East, it's not offensive at all. In fact, if anything, it's a little lax. Forgiveness is another example. In the West, we love to talk about forgiveness. We live in a guilt culture, and so forgiveness brings us freedom and release. In the Middle East, forgiveness is offensive. It's a shame culture. So forgiving your enemy simply demonstrates your weakness. Why would you ever do it? So, a question arises out of that. If you're offended, why do your cultural sensitivities trump everyone else's? And you realize there's an unquestioned assumption lying underneath that, isn't there? You think your culture is superior. It's a trap that we all fall into. But I want you just for a moment to bear with me, and uh, whether you're skeptical and unbelieving or whether you're a believer or not, doesn't matter. I just want you to uh, kind of have a moment where you imagine that you really do believe that the Bible is the revelation of God himself. Can you do that? Whether you believe that or not, just try and put yourself in that place where you think, yes, I believe the Bible is the revelation of God. It is not simply the product of a particular culture. Are you there? Okay. Wouldn't it contradict every culture at some point somewhere if it comes from outside every culture? Wouldn't it have to offend you for it to be revelation? Because otherwise, wouldn't it simply be something of your own creation or the creation of someone else? And what you realize is if the Bible is the revelation of God, it should offend. Offense actually becomes a reason not to say that it isn't the revelation of God, but to say that it is the revelation of God. And so you can, I think, trust the Bible, not only historically, but you can trust it culturally. Think about whether you're misunderstanding it. Think about your own cultural assumptions. Think about your own sense of cultural superiority. But the third thing is the most important thing. You have to trust the Bible personally. I'm sure you've asked yourself, why is it Christians take the Bible so seriously? Well, it's not about simply understanding a book That's not the aim of the Christian faith, to understand what these writers have said. That's the means. The aim is to have a relationship with God. But Christians believe you can't have a relationship with God without the book. Look at the text again, verse 32. The disciples say, were not our hearts burning within us? This is the seat of their emotions. It was the same then as it is now. It was all about their desires, their passions. They had burning hearts. They experienced a life-changing personal encounter with Jesus. When did that happen? When he opened the scriptures to them. And they understood what the Bible was saying. But how does that work? How can understanding the Bible lead to a personal encounter? Well, it's when we realize 
that the Bible is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You see, the disciples had misunderstood. Look at verse 25, Jesus' response. How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? They hadn't seen Jesus. Verse 27, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, the whole Bible is about Jesus. If you forget verse 27 of Luke chapter 24, the Bible just doesn't make any sense at all. If you assume the Bible is about you, it doesn't make any sense at all. How you must live, how you, what you must do, what you must believe. If that's you, you don't need a savior. You don't need a king. You just follow the rules. And I would suggest that you're reading the wrong book. That's how the Quran works. You see, if we understand this verse... When we read the Old Testament, we see Jesus everywhere. In the wilderness, the people of God have just been liberated from slavery in Egypt. And uh, they're out in the desert. And they are crying out because they are thirsty. And Moses strikes the rock with the rod of God's justice. And water pours out of the rock so they can have their thirst quenched. And Paul says, that's what Jesus does for us spiritually. He's the rock. The tabernacle, the people carried a mobile temple with them as they wandered around the wilderness. And whether you think about the sacrifice that took place in that tabernacle, the altar on which the sacrifice took place, the priest who made the sacrifice, the light that gave light to the courtyard, or the bread of the presence of God, all of those things point to Jesus. And if we miss that, we misunderstand the book. Let me give you another example. Moses. If the Bible is all about you, then Moses is an example for us to follow. We need to be strong. We need to be courageous. We need to be faithful. We need to be a leader like Moses. But if it's all about Jesus, then the story of Moses and the liberation of the Israelites from Egypt is about God's rescue and salvation. It's about the Passover lamb, where the people faced the judgment of God, and they sacrificed the lamb, and they daubed its blood on their doorposts, and so the angel of death passed over them. And if it's all about you, then that's just a ritual, isn't it, that you do every year. But if it's all about Jesus, just place yourself on that road with him, as those two disciples who never got that, and Jesus looks them in the eye and says to them, it's me. I am the Lamb of God. Those stories you have told yourselves and you've been, that have been told to you for your entire lives, they're about me. I am the Lamb of God. I am God who became a human being to absorb in myself your sin so that we could be together. Your heart would burn like theirs, wouldn't it? You see, it's, it's all about him. It's not about you. It's not about me. That's great news. Doesn't it make you want him? Doesn't it make your heart burn? Can you feel your heart burn when you think, just you put yourself in that place of those first disciples? And it's because there's a longing in all of our hearts. Our hearts long for purpose, for that infinite, intimate love, for a sense of significance and security. And we can find that in nothing. Nothing satisfies apart from Jesus. Only in him will the longings of our hearts be met. And where do we find Jesus? We find him in scripture. We find him in the Bible. When you realize that it's all about him. So just to wrap up. You can trust the Bible historically. You can trust the Bible culturally, but you must trust the Bible personally. Do you want your heart to burn within you like those guys on the road to Emmaus? Do you want the deepest longings of your heart to be satisfied 
to find their rest in that encounter with God. If you do, you've got to trust the Bible personally. Read it. Study it with others. Join a connect group. If you're not in a connect group, join. If you're in another church, join a Bible study or a home group or a hub, whatever name they call them. Just begin to study scriptures with others. We're doing, uh, starting a school of theology, uh, a new term in, in the autumn. We'll be looking at the Bible. Come and join us. Do it with others, but do it yourself. Buy a study Bible or uh, just begin to read it every day. Read your Bible. That's where you meet Jesus. Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened to us the scriptures? Can I just ask you to stand? We've got a, the chance to answer just a few questions um, this morning. So does that sound good? So first of all, let's welcome them. This is Barry and Sarah and Rod. Let's give them a big clap. And um, let's have the first question, please, up on the screen. I'm doing my timer here. So how do you tell which parts of the Bible are history and which parts are poetry? How do you tell which parts of the Bible are history and which parts are poetry? I guess what's behind this is just different ways of um, interpreting it and different ways of understanding it. So um, who'd like to have a stab at that first? Barry, go for it. (laughs) I think it's, it's like any book, the more you read it, the more it, it sort of becomes obvious, the sort of context, and the more you understand. It's like, it's, I think what we have to realize as we approach the Bible, it's a journey of discovery about, as Rod said, about a person. And um, interestingly, my dad has written a couple of books, and I've, uh, you know, there's different people around the world have read them and have emailed him questions, and I've often thought, oh, that, isn't that a bit obvious? And then I've realized, because I know my dad, um, the, because I know him really well, it's, it's very clear to me what he's saying. And I think um, that's the thing with the Bible. It's a journey of discovery, and the more we get to know it and get to know the character of God, the more it becomes more obvious, um, the context and, and, and what he's actually saying, and which parts are sort of more just pure historical and which parts are poetry and which parts are sort of direct commands. Great, thank you. Anything else to add? Um, I think it's... I think as you familiarize yourself with the Bible, you, you recognize the different genres that the Bible is made up of. I think very often uh, as we read it, we think it's a, um, a manual, uh, kind of a self-help manual with a lot of um, pithy uh, answers to um, how to live. It, it gives us kind of rules to follow, but actually uh, it's much more a story of what God has done for us um, uh, and uh, the outworking of, of salvation history, if you like. And, uh, and so it's, it's understanding the different genres, whether that is law or history or um, saga or uh, satire or poetry um, or gospel or letters. There's all sorts of, of different genres. And the Bible itself tends to give you quite clear signposts about what type of literature it is. Uh, I think a similar question was asked last week, and Darren said, you know, where in the Psalms where it says the trees of the field shall clap their hands, well, we probably are not going to take that l- literally. We're going to recognize that that's a poetic expression. So it's looking for those um, features of the text that give us an indication about how we ought to understand it. And, and even in looking at different types of text, that doesn't mean that there isn't truth in Mm. all of the different forms of text. So we look at the Psalms where they are poetry in their songs, but actually they say an awful lot about the character of God and who God is. Um, So I think you shouldn't just assume that we can only look at the things we term historical for truth. Actually, truth about God can be found in all of the different forms of literature across the different books of the Bible. Thank you. Next question. So what about the editors who choose which books make up the Bible? Couldn't they have instructed the inclusion list based on personal motives or gain? So um, what about the editors who chose which, Bibles, uh, which books make up the Bible? Couldn't they have constructed the inclusion list based on personal motives or gain? Try, try. Go on, Sarah. Um, I think there's one thing to be said about that in terms of the New Testament, which is normally what or often what this is directed at, um, is that actually the different books and letters that we have in the New Testament, many of those were across 
the early church. Um, and there was quite a lot of agreement at the time about which, what, what was seen as um, scripture. Um, so, I mean, there were, I think there were certain books that there was maybe slightly more debate on on whether they ended up in the final list, but, um, but certainly a, a great number of them, there was a huge amount of agreement before the kind of final decision in 300 and whatever on, on the actual what was the Bible. But, um, so it wasn't like suddenly it, someone came at one point and was like, oh, we'll pick this, this, and this. But actually, um, there was a lot of agreement across the groups of churches at the time as to what was scripture already. I mean, and that was remarkably early, I think. That's the amazing thing. So Irenaeus in the um, very early second century already is listing uh, the books that he considers to be authoritative or the churches considered to be authoritative. Um, and I think they included uh, everything that's in our New Testament apart from Hebrews, 2 Peter, and Revelation. And all of those books were then uh, considered authoritative by the second century. So uh, you often hear that it was the Council of Nicaea in 325 and Constantine who wanted to kind of give something solid to say this is our book uh, that actually chose those texts. But actually they had been the recognized authoritative texts in the life of the church for about 250 years before that. Um, and so really that council was only uh, reflecting what was already common practice. Okay, fantastic. I learned something there. Um, let's have the next question. What should you do if you try and turn your life over to Jesus and do Alpha courses over and over and still don't get it? <laughs> what should you do if you try and turn your life over to Jesus and do Alpha courses over and over and over and over and still don't get it? Great question. Larry. There's, um, what, what springs to my mind, there's a little verse in the Bible that says, um, ask and you will be given, seek and you will find, and knock and the door will be opened. Um, meaning those that come to Jesus, you know, that um, he, they, they will receive, they will find him. And one thing I learned about those verses, again, it's uh, the difference between, you know, the, the, the New Testament is written in Greek and some of the Old Testament, Hebrew and Aramaic. But the Greek word um, for ask is ask, means ask and keep on asking. And the Greek word for seek means seek and keep on seeking. And knock means knock and keep on knocking. So what the, the command is, if you ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, you will find. So um, anyone in that situation, I would encourage just to continue seeking and asking, and you will, you will find. Um, I remember somebody said once that atheism was uh, a lack of patience. And, and I think faith can be described in many ways as patience with, with the questions, with the way the world is, rather than rushing to answers when it's still, uh, you've still got those questions, you're still wrestling, you're still thinking. Um, and, I, and I would say uh, in that, hang in there, I think, really. That, you know, there are resources uh, post-alpha. Uh, I think often one-to-one -one study can be really helpful in that, so you can sit down and say, well, what are some of the issues you're challenging with? Uh, I would always encourage people to read uh, the Bible with others. You know, I think that's how the church has always done it, and it's only really in the modern world that we've tended to retire to our studies and, and study it for ourselves, by ourselves. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's that ongoing process. I'm still learning things. I still have loads of questions. There are still many things I don't get. Uh, Rick and I were debating uh, you know, social justice and social transformation a few months ago, uh, and the penny kind of dropped a little bit for me about how that kind of works in the whole story. And uh, my wife will often say to me, duh, I thought that 15 years ago. I mean, I, it, it takes me a while to get there. Um, so I'm still learning. And Sarah? Um, yeah, I just say that I think when you become a Christian, it's not like all of the doubts and the, and the as it's similar to what Rob was saying, um, they don't all stop, but actually almost they become even more. And um, certainly when I became a Christian, I had loads of questions, loads of things that I wanted to know. So I did read the Bible um, as a starting point, read loads of different books to address different questions that I had, talked to lots of people. So I think it is very much a journey, not a, a and, and I mean, when you become a Christian, it's, it's very much the beginning, not an end point. Um, and so the doubts and the questions, they keep on going. And, you, and actually, I think you're encouraged to really wrestle with it and not just to kind of blindly accept, but to you know, keep on asking and keep on um, wrestling with difficult questions, uh, and that's really part of it. 
Fantastic. We've got I, time for one more question. Can I just really quickly just 15 sneak in seconds. There and just say, <laughs> but do remember that the aim of, of that wrestling is not to work out answers to questions so much as to encounter a person. Mm -hmm. And so it's meeting Jesus there, and then you, with him you can begin to work through those questions. Very good. 15 seconds that was. <laughs> Let's have the last question up on the screen. So if the Bible is divine, why would that mean that cultures would be offended by it? I think the short answer is because cultures aren't divine um, and cultures are very much the product of what man has made them to be. Um, so I think, in, as Rod was saying in his sermon, you would only expect the fact that we wouldn't have got it all right um, and we wouldn't have, over time, we wouldn't have adopted uh, the things that God necessarily would say are the right ways to do things or the right processes to do them in. So I just think, yeah, cultures aren't divine, uh, but God is. Great, good answer. I mean, I hate being told I'm wrong. Do you, do you experience that? <laughs> I'm wrong quite a lot of the time. So maybe that's behind as well. Um, let's give these guys a big clap and um, well done. Put on the spot.